Uh, obviously, if they cut a lot of these things systematically or they cut, start to make significant cuts, it will be a no. Uh, but if all we've said is we're a no currently, if you don't have a strong, robust uh, Build Back Better bill, the reconciliation part, uh, we're willing to vote no. So it's not like we're trying to finagle out of a, a no vote. If the vote came tomorrow in one hour, I'd be a no. And so would 40 or 50 other folks, so unless there's some miraculous uh, proposal in the next 48 hours, that's where we're, we're headed. Uh, but we, we are want to continue the conversation. And if we can get substantive parts of uh, the progressive agenda through, we will be a yes, realizing we got to build, get more progressives elected to the House and, and to the Senate. In terms of mobilization, I think the mobilization we need is to get more progressives into the House elected and into the Senate elected. I'm not sure mobilizing in, in Manchin's district where Trump carried it by 30 percent is actually what's going to move him uh, on these policies. Well, Manchin is, you know, he's all of West Virginia, not a district. And I would remind you, Bernie won every county in West Virginia. So it seems to me by the polls, the people of West Virginia want the majority of what's in this. I'll also remind you, Joe Manchin didn't win by that much uh, for Senate back in 2018. He narrowly won. Uh, I want to I want to drill back into something because I think a lot of people, progressives are going to are listen to your last statement saying, I think really what needs to happen mobilization wise is getting more progressives in here. But at the same time, they would say, well, I knocked on doors for AOC, uh, you know, the rest of them. I, I volunteered. I donated, you know, et cetera, et cetera. No, that's great. And technically, we have we've had numbers for months to basically block most legislation, at least in the House. Uh, we could debate the wisdom of that, but we got them in. So the organization has happened. Do we have majorities? No. Yet there's not really been court until now. There hasn't really been much coordination voting as a block and actually leveraging one's vote. So what would you say to people that would say, yeah, I'm not going to keep pushing to elect more progressives if they're going to continue preemptively folding? And, I, and what we think should be the mobilization. Reading how far the. Oh, go ahead. I think that's misreading how far we've come. I mean, remember when Barack Obama in 2008 did the financial crash, which is arguably even a greater economic crisis than we had during COVID. I mean, or at least it's comparable. And he had to debate whether he could get a 750 or 800 billion stimulus check. And people were concerned about austerity politics. And there wasn't a focus on the working class or the, or the poor with the child tax credit. And now Biden uh, it starts out uh, where we're getting 1.9 trillion and there's not the conversation on deficits and there is a focus on the child tax credit and there is a stimulus, uh, I mean, a monthly checks that are going out to people actually giving them checks that we've come a long way from the conversation in the Obama years. And I don't think that that suddenly that Joe Biden has transformed in all his thinking from when he was in the Obama administration. I think he is a, a, a person who has always been sensitive to where the party is, and he understands that the progressives have, have a huge voice in the party, uh, including the people that many of you have helped elect uh, mm -hmm. in the Congress. So we can debate whether we've come far enough, whether we're t tough enough, strong enough, but no one can debate that the progressives who have been in Congress have moved the debate because of the base significantly in a progressive, uh, progressive direction and a rejection of neoliberalism, which I define as deindustrialization, uh, offshoring of jobs, radical privatization, which led to depressed wages where people can no longer support their families and communities. And that uh, picture is something that I would argue that even Joe Biden now recognizes and is trying to address. Let me ask you, I don't, I don't want to relitigate force to vote. Obviously, that's a very, I, I was for it. I still think you should do those tactics. But what is the actual strategy now among progressives? Obviously, the focus right now is on this 3.5 trillion bill. What is the actual strategy to achieve Medicare for all? I understand we don't have the White House, but I don't think progressives could just kind of like take four year pauses in, in trying to obtain this just because we don't have the White House or Congress. Is there a Co co you know, a coherent strategy among progressives in Congress to keep fighting for Medicare for all? There is. But first of all, I do think that the president matters. And I think any progressive, anyone quote unquote running as a progressive in the beginning should just embrace uh, the Sanders Medicare for all bill and that that shouldn't be, you know, we had to litigate that and people going all over the place on the different candidates. Uh, there are a lot of issues that, you know, progressives may disagree on. 
I, I think that ought to be a prerequisite if you want to uh, be the presidential candidate for a progressive uh, movement um, or, or in contention, you ought to support Medicare for all and make that a priority in, 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 uh, in getting that through. And I do think, obviously, having the presidency matters. That said, we don't. But we still have important uh, positions uh, in the Senate and House. This is why Medicare expansion matters so much and why uh, Senator Sanders is absolutely right to uh, insist on it. Because if we expand Medicare and we start with the seniors and they start getting dental and hearing and, uh, and, and they start getting vision, they'll, they'll say, oh, this is what they meant with uh, Medicare for all. This is what Bernie was talking about. Well, this isn't socialized radical medicine. This just means that I get more uh, ability to, to, to have a healthy life, that I have more choice in my my my, my uh, medical options, and then let's do it till sixty. So we start to move the uh, the age and slowly expand uh, it, it, while we we have uh, while we don't have the presidency. And even Bernie was a four year plan, so it went to fifty five, forty five, thirty five. So let's uh, let's start taking directions and expanding Medicare, both in terms of benefits and in terms of age. Uh, and that I think is the, the the strategy in Congress, which is why the Medicare expansion fight is such a critical one. Uh, on uh, in this reconciliation bill. And what do you, uh, I know you're not going to give me a firm number, but you say the number doesn't matter. I think it does. I mean, are well, we talking? I mean, it matters. I mean, it, it matters within reason. I mean, obviously. Right. Well, let's know. talk about that reason. So like to me, I I personally, I, I would say no, anything be below 3 trillion. I mean, you've already gone down from 6 trillion, which according to Bernie, a lot of the caucus w believed in 6 trillion. Uh, to me, when you're dealing with, you know, the mansions of the world, the Gottheimers of the world, they're probably shooting closer to two trillion. So what is kind of that? What is that red line in terms of where you won't go? You know, I don't even think they're at two trillion from the conversations. I think they're well south of that. Uh, let me ask you this, though. What would you if, I mean, hypothetically, someone comes up with a, a number uh, and uh, you say no. And then that means, let's say, cinema and others are OK, we don't want to do anything because they'd be fine with that. It's not like they have that much vested in uh, universal child care and, uh, and preschool and the environmental uh, provisions. You would be fine risking sort of nothing uh, compared to doing something. Well, I think that's always the simplistic framing. I would say this is about more than just than just this bill. I think at a certain point, you know, some people, for example, thought Bernie should have tried to delay and block. Uh, the first uh, CARES Act in 2020 during the beginning of the pandemic uh, because it was an upward transfer of wealth. I didn't agree with that because people desperately needed unemployment. Right. And, you know, uh, but now, you know, to me, these are desperately needed programs. But at the same time, you know, at a certain point, if progressives don't actually show, no, we will not kind of just say yes to severely watered down neoliberal legislation, because it's not just the number that would, be, would go down. You're talking a lot of the programs would be cut, changed, et cetera, et cetera. I think progressives need to show the Democratic Party, particularly, you know, the leadership. Uh, and even if the leadership was originally for the 3.5 trillion, that we're, we're not going to continue uh, basically well, that folding. I and that, that would be my position. Vote, that's why we're willing to vote no on the bipartisan infrastructure deal. But I don't think a reconciliation bill that's negotiated, let's see what form. I mean, obviously, they're, they cut key climate provisions, cut key uh, provisions on child care and universal preschool and paid family leave and uh, free community college. Then, yes, OK, you're uh, if, they, if they, all they have in there uh, are provisions on uh, certain infrastructure improvements, then, yes, you are. Uh, watering down. My guess is that a lot of these provisions are things that have been progressive aspirations, Bernie's aspirations for uh, the past two decades. And if we can get a significant amount of that, uh, you will have a lot of people saying yes. But a lot of the details matter, right? I mean, if they start to gut it in ways that uh, aren't significantly building on a, a progressive vision, that matters. Uh, and if they're not willing to raise taxes on uh, wealthy people, that matters. And so it's a it's a balancing call of are we really making uh, headway towards a, a, a progressive agenda or, or are we not? It's harder for progressives because we want desperately these things uh, to pass. Uh, this is why many of us came to Congress. We want deeply believe we need childcare, we need universal preschool, we need climate legislation, and we're not willing uh, 
uh, to just let two, three, four years pass uh, just to make a, a, a political point um, if we can get substantive legislation. On the other hand, we don't want to uh, not sh to have the paradigm remain the same in the status quo. Uh, I do believe we've succeeded in shifting the president's paradigm to a more progressive vision. Uh, we, I think, in voting no on this infrastructure bill, which we're willing to do, uh, which will either result in its failure or Pelosi not bringing it to the floor on Monday, are making a clear sense of that the progressive caucus can't can't be ignored. Um, and then I think it, it becomes a negotiation, which I hope succeeds, but there's no guarantee. And isn't there a, a bit of a risk in deflating the progressive bases for the next elections? Because I don't think this is, you know, I don't think it's all progressives, but I, there is, I mean, you see it, there's a large swath of the progressive movement that is now shifting to screw it all, we're going to go outside of electoral politics. These people said, you know, ran on, let's bring the ruckus to the Democratic Party. We feel they're doing a little bit too more, too much inside negotiating and not really bringing that forceful fight. I disagree with you. I think it would make a big difference actually going to Joe Manchin's doorstep. Uh, you might say they don't care. Well, Ernie, uh, AOC's former staffers started a super PAC. One of the first things they did was put ads on, on the air in West Virginia uh, when Joe Manchin was saying he's not going to do $2,000 checks earlier this year, and he started walking that back when he got a little pressure. So, I, I mean, don't, are you not concerned at all? I get focusing on what would be achieved, but what is the risk if you're deflating the base who think you're not fighting hard enough? Well, one, I think the base will look at what we are achieving. And if we're getting significant progressive wins, like getting out of Afghanistan, which the president deserves credit, but so does the progressive movement, if we're getting uh, a child uh, refundable tax credit, if we're getting universal child care preschool, we can say, look, here is, we should be honest, we didn't get $15, here's where we fell short, but here's where we're advancing things, keep uh, helping us build so that we can have a progressive era, a new progressive era. Remember, it, progressive era, in 1895, it took 15, 20 years for the progressive movement to have an impact. The, the New Deal was over at least 10, 15 years. The Great Society was over 10 years. So to think it, with a president who was largely a centrist, got elected as a centrist, is moving to the left, that suddenly we're going to achieve the entire progressive vision, I think is unrealistic. The question is, are we making progress? That said, I don't have any problem with someone who says, I, I think the best use of my talents my passion uh, are not being uh, dedicating myself full time to the Democratic Party. Obviously, it's in my interest to say they should. But some of the great leaders, Martin Luther King, uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, were not people uh, of the party. They worked with the party, but they pressured the party. They protested the party. They uh, mobilized outside the party. And if there are people who want to mobilize and protest and take stands uh, to hold Democrats' feet to the fire, to hold progressives' feet to the fire, I think that's healthy for a democracy. So uh, my view is what would be awful is if people just start, sat at home uh, and if they got deflated about progress in this country, as long as they are expressing their activism, I'd love for a lot of that to be uh, for the progressive democratic causes, but I understand if they feel that their activism is uh, better expressed through outside the system and they're also necessary ultimately to make progress.